All right, thank you all for, uh, thank you for being here today. I am James Taylor. I'm Senior Fellow for Environment Policy here at Heartland. And we have a fantastic panel lined up for you to, to discuss the future of energy in America. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to give a, a brief overview of what the status uh, of energy is here in America. And I'll, I'll give us another, say, 30 seconds so we can all get in our seats. Or we can be like at home where my daughters ignore me when I talk. I'll feel right at home that way. All right, fantastic. When we, when we hear about energy policy, when we hear about the status of energy in America, we often hear from, uh, from the president about whether or not producing oil, producing natural resources will have effect on prices of gasoline at the pump. When we think about energy policy, gasoline prices are what we think about first and foremost. And so the argument is that for those that advocate producing more energy, for those that advocate uh, producing oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, for example, that, well, we can produce oil in Anwar, but it's only going to affect the price of gasoline by, say, a nickel a gallon because oil is a global market. Well, President Obama is right in, in this regard that oil is indeed a global market. And certainly if we produce oil in Anwar, it's not going to cut the price of gasoline in half overnight. It may only have, say, five cents per gallon of an impact on prices. But there are two points here we have to keep in mind. One is that it's not just Anwar. We have tremendous resources of oil in Anwar. We have them off the Atlantic coast. We have them off the Pacific coast. We have them in the Gulf of Mexico. We have them in the Rowan Plateau uh, in, in Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, for example. When you add these together, that would have a significant impact on prices. But more importantly, the question is this. When, when the price of oil goes up, say, in the United States, and we know that oil is a global market, what happens to the price of gasoline here in the United States? It rises. What happens to the price of gasoline in Saudi Arabia and Venezuela? Oil is a global market. Remember, President Obama reminds us of this. That means the price of gasoline goes up in Venezuela and Saudi Arabia as well. And yet, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, they're doing their best to increase the price of oil. So, so, so how does that apply to us here? What it teaches us is that, true on the back end, consumers in Saudi Arabia and Venezuela pay more for their gasoline when oil prices rise. On the front end, those nations, they bring in more wealth through producing and exporting oil than their citizens pay on the back end for higher gasoline prices. Those nations that are blessed with energy resources and produce those energy resources benefit from rising energy prices. Now let's bring that back to the United States. When energy prices rise, we're hurting. Our president goes to Saudi Arabia and begs them to produce more oil so that prices will lower. Why do we do this? It's because we're acting like an energy poor nation. But the question is, are we in fact an energy poor nation? Here's a fantastic study. This was produced earlier this year by the Congressional Research Service. Actually, it was late last year. And what they did is they, they looked at the inventories. They looked at the, the, the reserves of oil, natural gas, and coal in nations around the world. And what they found is that the United States, when you combine those three major energy sources, has more than twice as much energy than every other nation on Earth, with the lone exception of Russia. We still have more than Russia, but Russia is the only nation on Earth that has as much as half the natural resources that we do in the United States. And yet here we are, we are, we are suffering economic pain when energy prices rise. The reason is, whereas nations like Russia, nations like Saudi Arabia, nations like Venezuela, they produce and they export from their natural resources. We have made a political decision not to do so. We are not an energy poor nation. We are an energy rich nation that has made political choices to behave like an energy poor nation. I was speaking uh, during the break earlier with Ken Ivory. Uh, you may recognize him. He asked the question of, uh, of Congressman Joe Walsh earlier. And uh, Ken out of Utah points out that the federal government owns most of the land in Utah. This is a major reason why we are behaving like an energy poor nation. 60% of federal lands are completely off limits for energy production. 30% of federal lands are technically available for energy production, but there are so many environmental restrictions that for all practical purposes, we can't produce energy there. Less than 10% of federal lands are available for energy production. Now this is especially important when we consider 
that the federal government owns the vast majority of land in the western third of our nation. This is precisely where we have so many energy reserves. And then, of course, offshore, the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast, the Gulf of Mexico, again, the federal government controls it. So what we have is an energy-rich nation by which the federal government owns most of the land where our energy is and then renders it off limits for production. Now, we see an alternate course we can pursue. In North Dakota, one of our panelists here, Betty Grandy, representative from the state of North Dakota. In North Dakota, most of their oil resources are not under federal land. As a result, North Dakota produces more oil right now than the OPEC nation of Ecuador. That's how much oil, that's how much natural resources we have, that a single state can outproduce an OPEC nation. As a result, the unemployment rate in North Dakota is under 3%, even during this long-standing recession, under 3%. Gasoline prices, sure, they're, they're higher in North Dakota right now than they were two years ago. But because North Dakota produces from their energy resources, unemployment is so low, people graduate from high school and make six figures working the oil fields or working in other industries associated with energy production. This is the option we have as a nation. This is what our energy future can be. But we've made political choices that instead we're an energy poor nation and we suffer whenever energy prices rise. We don't need to suffer every time energy prices rise. We can benefit from that. Now, that being the case, uh, we have a fantastic panel I'd like to introduce here today. You have bios, and uh, the bios are, are extensive, and I've tried to cut them down, and even that's hard because they're, they're so well qualified. But let's start with Betty Grandy. Betty Grandy represents the 41st district in North Dakota, in the North Dakota House of Representatives. She was first elected in 1996. And I'm happy to say she has proven herself to be a rock in the American Legislative Exchange Council where uh, various model legislation and resolutions are proposed for legislators to bring back to their states. She's been a rock on the side of energy production, sound science, strong free market economics. It's truly a pleasure to have her here. She's also a member of the Heartland Legislative Forum. Uh, next in the middle, uh, sitting in the middle chair on our panel, we have Ben Zyker. Ben Zyker is president of Benjamin Zyker Economics Associates. He's a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute, a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and associate in the Intelligence Community Associates Program of the Office of Economic Research, Bureau of Intelligence and Research, U.S. Department of State. And also closest to me now, we have Bernard Weinstein, goes by Bud. Uh, Bud is associate director of the McGuire Energy Institute and an adjunct professor of business economics in the Cox School of Business at Southern Methodist University. I'll point out that he received his bachelor's degree in public administration from Dartmouth College, which automatically makes him the most knowledgeable and intelligent person in the room, right? <laughs> I went to Dartmouth too. That's a setup question. <laughs> but these are our panels. So let's begin. Uh, we'll come over here. And I'd like to ask you the, the same question here that, uh, that were posed in the title of this panel. What is the future of energy in America? And let's start with you, Betty, because you're in North Dakota. You see what's happening uh, in the oil fields and natural gas production. What do you see as the future of, of energy production? Well, you know, the, the great thing about it is North Dakota is, is, a, a laboratory, is the laboratory for technology when it comes to oil and gas and, and really coal and all the industries that come for energy. The key to this is that the development of energy in, the, in our nation is what is national security. It will be what leads us to national security. You talk about the OPEC nations, and we have the ability to pull that out. We're pulling out really only 10% in our fracking right now. We have the ability to have this a very long term if the federal government will stay out of the state of North Dakota. We have a great regulatory system in North Dakota already. We don't need the federal government to tell us how to do anything. We're, show, we're proving that. The one thing I thought was very interesting at breakfast when Congressman Walsh said that we are in um, now a second revolution. Interesting, because really we are in the second industrial revolution. And that's being proven in North Dakota right now and it's passing down all the way through from Texas all the way up and it can expand in other areas. Pennsylvania is doing well. In, in developing that tight shale fracking too. They just have a little bit difference where their water lays versus where ours does. But, but with that, this industrial revolution and the natural gas development, we, we currently have 18 natural gas plants that have opened up in the last three to five years in North Dakota. With that, 
we are seeing manufacturing coming back to the United States because it's a billion dollars in savings on the energy side of things for companies to bring back. So, I mean, this, is, this isn't just about getting oil. It's about everything and what needs to take place. And Ben, how about you? Well, uh, in terms of the future of uh, energy in the U.S., I think I would uh, disaggregate that question into, into two components. One, transportation fuels, and second, uh, power generation. And with respect to transportation fuels, um, I think it's, it's somewhat safe to predict that the ethanol insanity will wither away over time. It may have to be accompanied by a... Uh, I didn't realize I was quite so powerful, but in any event, um, <laughs> it may have to be uh, accompanied by either the preservation or the expansion of various other agricultural subsidies in order to buy off uh, the, various, the various interest groups in the Corn Belt, but my, I, it's hard for me to see something this patently uneconomic and environmentally destructive um, can be preserved uh, under current and projected, is my mic working, uh, economic conditions. Uh, whether the extent to which oil will be replaced by natural gas, transportation fuels, I don't have a strong insight into. If I were smart, I'd be rich, and trust me, I'm not either. And um, it's somewhat predictable, I guess, that cheap natural gas, which uh, I think is, is about as certain a thing as you can have in this, in this world, uh, will to some degree replace oil as a transportation, transportation fuel. <coughs> is very, very likely. The extent to which that's likely to happen, I don't know. In terms of power production, um, uh, with or without the Obama administration's um, uh, regulatory onslaught, I think that the domestic use of coal is likely to shrink, um, certainly relative to the use of natural gas and probably absolutely uh, merely because of price dynamics. Uh, gas prices now at, what, $2 per million BTUs, and it's hard for me to see them rising much above $4 per, per million BTUs uh, <clears throat> over the foreseeable future, given the, uh, the revolution in, uh, in horizontal drilling and all the rest and fracking. And um, uh, so I would predict that the coal industry will grow as uh, the market for coal for power production overseas grows in India and other places. But domestically, I would predict that there would be a replacement of, uh, of coal by natural gas over time, which has a number of advantages socially uh, as well. My view is uh, I, I'm a bit worried that we're stuck with a small uh, level of subsidies, both implicit and explicit, for wind and solar power and the other, other kinds of, uh, of sandbox toys that the left loves to, uh, loves to use in, as they pretend that we can run a modern industrial economy on the, on the basis of uh, fantasies. So I think, I think my own guess is that the PTC, the production tax credit for wind, which is scheduled to phase out at the end of this year, um, if I had to venture a guess, my guess is it'll be extended for some number of years. Perhaps it'll be phased out, unquote, and then as the phase out approaches, it'll be extended again. I think we're sort of stuck with that kind of stuff. Uh, I hope not, but my guess is we're stuck with it for, for a while. And the last point I would make, uh, nuclear power, nuclear power generation, I think is even without the delays imposed by the regulators and the rest, probably is not economic uh, under current uh, natural gas, uh, current projected natural gas prices. Uh, Yucca Mountain and reprocessing is a bit of a sideshow. I don't think it's really very, very important. And in fact, I think that whole issue, except to Harry Reid, is really not very important. Why we continue to adhere to uh, an executive order signed by Jimmy Carter uh, you know, decades ago, I, I've never quite understood that we ought to get rid of that and simply allow reprocessing 
The idea that the United States of America cannot safeguard plutonium is, is kind of silly, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay too much attention to those arguments. So I th but I do think, given uh, a reasonable set of projections about natural gas prices, I just don't see how nuclear power uh, plant investment can be made economic, and my guess is that will, that will also wither away domestically. And Bud, what about uh, your view on uh, America's energy future? Well, I want to pick up on Betty's comment that we're undergoing a second industrial revolution. Because if you think about it, producing oil and natural gas from shale is more of a manufacturing process than, than, than a wildcatting process. And, and it's, it's incredible to think that despite the moratorium on drilling in the Gulf of Mexico after the Macondo accident, that for the last three years, we have seen an increase in domestic oil production. Now, it's nowhere near where it was 20 or 30 years ago. We've had three consecutive years of, of increase, and, and last year was the highest level of production in the decade. And it's all because of the shale revolution and because of new production, land-based production, in places like South Texas and the Bakken in, in North Dakota. And, and, and it's doubly amazing uh, to consider that despite the pushback from the Obama administration and their anti-carbon crowd, we saw last year record production of natural gas, more natural gas than we've ever produced. And I like to say, well, suppose we had public policies that were accommodating to fossil fuel production as opposed to resisting fossil fuel production, we'd be in, in, in even better shape. Now, every president since Jimmy Carter has professed to have an energy policy, but the energy policy is pretty much a statement, and the statement for the last 30 to 40 years has been, we need to wean ourselves off of imported oil. Now, that's absolutely silly as a policy objective. You know, in fact, we've been reducing our imports of oil. But what we need in terms of energy policy is something that is sensible, something that's comprehensive, and, and a policy that recognizes, as, as, as we just heard, that America is an energy-rich nation. And you're familiar with statistics. I don't have to go over them. You know, we're, we're sitting on you know, billions and billions of proven reserves on the Outer Continental Shelf for oil. We've got more natural gas than we know what to do with. I'm, I'm not about to write off nuclear power. I mean, nuclear power is important. I, I think uh, nuclear power will continue to play a role, but in the face of cheap gas and the fact that a lot of states have de deregulated uh, retail and wholesale electric power, uh, utilities can't automatic in those states, utilities can't automatically bake the cost of a nuclear plant into the rate base. So that, that, that poses, poses some problems. Um, but uh, I, I also think in terms of energy policy, uh, we need to think in North American terms uh, rather than U.S. terms. And, and if you look at this controversy over the Keystone XL pipeline and, and how significant that supply of, from the oil sands is already to our total oil consumption and, and how much more could be provided to us from, uh, from the province of Alberta. The president's decision to essentially veto that pipeline, at least temporarily, was a real slap in the face. I think it was a real political faux pas. We're supposed to have a common market in energy with Canada. And for political reasons, uh, the environmentalists think if they can kill the pipeline, they're going to kill the oil sands, and that's just nonsense. And Canada's already looking to, to build uh, additional capacity to sell their oil to, uh, to the Pacific nations uh, if they can't sell it to us, even though you know, we're the most logical market. Um, and, and that would build up the North American infrastructure, and I'd, I'd much rather be buying my oil from Canada than from Venezuela or Mexico. Venezuela for political reasons, Mexico simply because, you know, Pemex is in such trouble right now uh, that their production has been declining. They're even talking about allowing American companies to, you know, take, uh, take positions in Pemex. But uh, we, we, when it comes to energy policy, uh, we really haven't had one since, we haven't had a sensible, well, <laughs> that's not the word to use. We, we haven't had a comprehensive energy policy since the Carter years. And we had, uh, in the Carter years, after the OPEC embargo, uh, turned out to be the wrong type of policy. Because if you recall, all of those acts that were passed in the 1970s were the, based on the premise of domestic shortages. 
So we had to allocate. We had to restrict the use of fuels. We couldn't use natural gas to generate electricity. Uh, all kinds of silly stuff. And, and, and when Reagan came in and most of those programs were disbanded, uh, we did see an increase in domestic energy production. So uh, I think the United States has a, a, a tremendous energy future. Uh, we're already the world's uh, largest exporter of coal. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't become a major exporter of natural gas in liquefied form. But again, we need public policies that are accommodating uh, not restrictive. And I think it's fair to say that the current administration, in terms of energy, has been captured by what I call the anti-carbon true believers who think that we can fulfill all of the nation's future energy needs through a combination of renewables, conservation, and efficiency. And that's just ridiculous. Okay. That you can't know, happen. You know, and on, on that same thing, though, I think that what's important is, you know, pointing out this war on words, and you've heard me say that before, but the war on words, and we have to start winning this war. One, uh, peak oil. You, you talked about, we're going to run out, we're going to run out. No, we have no, we're not even close to having a definition of where we're at for peak oil because we're just scratching the surface. But you know, ironically, we've already reached peak oil, and that was in 2005. 2005, the United States consumed what will probably be the highest level of petroleum consumption ever. And because of efficiencies in energy use, we're actually seeing a drop in petroleum conssumption. So in, in that sense, but, but in we have the ability of discovery. And no, we no, still, no, the, the proven, and you, you brought, you brought right. that up in the, in the proven, proven uh, fields. And we have that proven, but we have the probabilities still above and beyond that, because just even in the Bakken and Three Fork and Tyler, and, and, and you, you're not even talking about Eagle Ford and, Marcellus and in all of these development areas, we're just scratching the surface on these and taking out such a small percentage. We're not close to hitting that peak oil. We've hit the peak of what we might be using, right. but the reu to, to develop it and have it, we're not even coming close to. And they have ill defined that. We have a bigger uh, proven oil reserves showing now since 1977. It, it, it's the biggest we're seeing in, in, the, in the billions that is still sitting out there. I only, I only mention that because most Americans and maybe most politicians don't understand that in terms of consumption of oil, we're already on the downward slope, that we've made, we've made a lot of progress in terms of energy efficiency. When I hear the president and others talk about America being energy hogs, it really, it really gets my goat because we're not. We use more energy than any other country because we have the biggest economy. But our efficiency in ener energy use has improved markedly. But we'll continue to use the hydrocarbons for at least another oh, nine years. And we're not going to eliminate hydrocarbon in vehicles. I mean, it, it, as much as we might be able to try to force those types of things, it's not going to happen. Not in states such as uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Minnesota. You're not going to run across the state of North Dakota in an electric car. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> So, Especially in January, <laughs> you know, and, and so uh, it, 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 it's, it's a misnomer to think that we're ever going to get away from the use of hydrocarbons. The other war on words is the contamination. The contamination, uh, fracking is contaminating, oh, 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 that's all a bunch of lies. There have been many, many uh, holes dug in the ground. We, what we've had over a million wells fracked in our nation. Not one has produced contamination. Not one. What? The what? stories you've heard were all lies dealing with those. That natural gas was already in the water. It was not produced because of the fracking. And there has to be the clarity that brings, is brought about to that. It's a war on words. And we have to be the ones to win that war. The other side is global warming. That's all, it's, it's, it's a fact, fact versus fiction entity. And we have to deal with that in the whole energy industry. Well, those those, those are good points. So let me ask a question here, though, or, or let me preface it this way. Um, we know that oil is a global market. The price of oil rises and falls globally because oil is easily shipped overseas. Uh, with natural gas, however, it's much more difficult to transport natural gas overseas. So in that regard, when we have our, uh, our fracking revolution that allows us to produce so much more oil and so much more natural gas, we see that the price of natural gas has fallen dramatically and is unlikely to be, uh, uh, to, to be affected by international events. So that being the case, we often hear uh, from President Obama and others 
and, and it's not just uh, Democrats, Republicans say this too, that, that we need an all of the above approach to energy. So the question is, if we have natural gas prices falling dramatically, we have such abundance that we can utilize natural gas so much, what are the economic uh, consequences of, say, for solar renewable, solar wind, other renewables, if we take it all of the above approach as to all of the above deserve a certain amount of government set aside market share versus all, an all of the above approach where all can compete in a free market? What happens when we set aside a certain amount of market share, take it away from natural gas, coal, and give it to wind and solar? So let me ask that of our economists here. Well, uh, you wind up with waste uh, to be to coin a not very original phrase. Uh, to the extent that we subsidize the uneconomic generation of, of, uh, of electricity, we waste tax dollars, we waste uh, economic resources, we wind up with more pollution rather than less mm -hmm. because of the need to uh, operate backup conventional generation plants inefficiently. Um, there's more, uh, more transmission investment needed because, um, because obviously wind farms can't be located just anywhere, they have to be located where the wind blows. And um, so, I mean, you're absolutely right, the, uh, the policies are quite wasteful, uh, they're quite destructive. Uh, the idea that, that renewable electricity generation, quote, is clean, unquote, is really quite incorrect. Uh, take wind power, for example, they, it kills depending on whose estimates you want to believe, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of birds every year, including protected species like you know, bald eagles and golden eagles. <clears throat> we shut down the timber industry in the Pacific Northwest over what was essentially a phony story about the northern spotted owl. Uh, for some reason that I've never quite understood, the actual destruction of birds by the American wind industry seems not to raise the hackles of the left-wing environmentalists. I don't quite understand why uh, wind power generates, you know, or uh, creates, you know, flicker effects. It's noisy, toxic metal pollution for now in China. When we start producing uh, heavy metals to go into the turbines, uh, that's a problem we're going to have to deal with to the extent that we continue to subsidize wind power, solar energy, uh, consumes vast amounts of land for the for very little production capacity and in fact in California the state for w in which I am proud to call home uh, the this very same Sierra Club that has been promoting solar power in the abstract for decades now opposes all the proposals in the Mojave Desert etc in an effort to protect the tortoises and uh, and other other forms of God God's creatures but uh, so anyway, uh, the answer to your question, Jim, is uh, you know we waste a lot of resources, we wind up with a dirtier environment, and the world is a worse place. What else would you expect from a bunch of left-wing policies other than that outcome? Bud. Well, <clears throat> I'll be a little more charitable. Uh, <laughs> That's because you're young and naive. <laughs> I, I mean, me, you know, philosophically, I don't, I don't have a problem with what we might call the infant industries argument. That goes back to Alexander Hamilton, the notion of, of sub subsidizing new ventures to help them get off the ground. Really? How, did any, how did any industry get off the ground without okay. subsidies then? Uh, but the, the, the problem with renewables, the, the subsidies didn't start with the Obama administration. We've been subsidizing wind and solar for, for almost 20 years. We've probably thrown $150 billion of direct taxpayer money uh, at wind and solar. It's currently running at about uh, 15 billion a year. But we're only getting 3% of the nation's electricity from wind and solar, while wind and solar are getting 76% of all the subsidies, tax credits, tax preferences, whatever you want to call them. I, I think it's time to reduce those subsidies. We, we've got to put renewables, we, we have to subject them to the market test. And the whole notion that we were going to revive our moribund economy by, by, by investing in renewable energy and electric cars and all this other stuff was silly, but that was just the Obama administration you know, paying off the various constituencies that had accepted his election. But the, the, the subsidies really are egregious. Do you know for, for the, the subsidy, the direct taxpayer subsidy for one megawatt of solar production is, is uh, $775? 
And for wind, it's about $100. For oil and gas, it's 64 cents. So, uh, Betty, in, in North Dakota, you are in the epicenter of this energy revolution. Uh, for those of us that don't live there, it, it's an abstract concept. Can you tell us on the ground what you're seeing in terms of what's happening with the economy? Is it just oil companies making a ton of money off the back of the, the rest of the people of the state? What's happening with the environment? What's happening with the infrastructure of the state? What, what, what are the effects of, of an energy production revolution in North Dakota? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's really quite fascinating. Um, I represent um, Fargo, which is on the eastern side of the state, but um, I own a business in the western side of the state. I was born and raised in Williston, which is the epicenter of oil and gas. And uh, so we opened up a business this uh, a few months ago in a town called Stanley, of which is uh, an area that is bombarded. It, it's a community that has more than tripled in size in a very short period of time. And so in that, um, is it oil? No. Every rig that is drilling employs around 120 people. The average salary on that rig is 90,000 plus. This is, this is high school kids, as you talked about, as long as they're um, skilled enough and, and capable of doing the job, they're being trained and brought onto these rigs. This is anywhere from hauling water to or from a rig, laying down a platform. The service industry that comes with it is a bigger aspect of the play than the oil company itself. And the oil companies themselves, and I'm not here to say one is better than another or not, but the players in the Bakken and in, in the tight shales are, are small players. Now, somebody would say Continental is not a small player, but they are compared to the Exxons and, and all the others. And yes, they are a part of it, but they are not as much as the Whitings and the Continentals and these smaller players that are doing the work and getting this done. But along with that is that service industry that comes with it is what's really bringing the jobs in. It's the trucking industries, it's the rail, it's, um, it's, it's every aspect of development of putting up that rig and the one thing that North Dakota did right that we talk about this renewable type of thing that I, I always find really interesting. In North Dakota, our coal industry is very big. Reclamation, if they don't return the land to exactly, exactly the way they found it, we don't allow them to have the coal. Same goes for oil. When that rig is done producing, they have 30 days to return it to normal. And that re includes the roads. So it's, it's very important to us in North Dakota that we do it that way. Wind has not been put to that same test, and that's a big frustration in every state along the way. And so any of the legislators that are dealing with wind industry, please put that into your laws and into your ways that reclamation is, is to the same standard. Um, but it, it is, it's not about the big companies getting money. It's about the 120 people that are put on a rig at any given time to make it produce with the service industry that is going to go out to about 49 years for the life of a rig and how much it takes to keep it running. Now, I, 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 we, I do believe we have time for questions. Is that right, Kendall? Excellent. So we'll open the floor for questions. And look at that. We have one already. Who would figure it would be Jay Lair? If you never hear another word about energy than what you have just heard from these people, you know all you will ever need to know about energy. Every single word they said was accurate, uh, and this is just uh, an amazing panel. I've, uh, about the only uh, question I would make is that Jimmy Carter's executive uh, ruling to not allow reprocessing of uranium was overturned by Ronald Reagan in 1992, the uranium industry did not have uh, the courage to move forward with reprocessing. Uh, and you're right, uh, you're, uh, atomic power is going to die on the vine right now for at least 100 years or so because of natural gas. And frankly, they, they deserve it. 
because they've tried to promote atomic power by saying we don't p produce greenhouse gases that produce climate change, so they deserve uh, whatever, uh, whatever they get. But this panel is amazing. I mean, absolutely uh, the be all end all of, everybody, of all you ever need to know about energy in this country. And within three years, everybody in America will know we are the richest uh, energy country in the world. And beginning in January, uh, we will begin opening up uh, federal lands to energy because there is little doubt we will have a new administration in January. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yes, Ralph Watts from uh, Iowa. Is this mic on? No. no. Okay. Uh, Ralph Watts, uh, representing from Iowa. Your, your comments, uh, as I understood what you were saying, uh, that you really, uh, to me, kind of kicked coal to the side. And given the huge amount of resources we have in this country, the fact that the negatives on coal are basically red herrings and false doctrine, uh, can we afford to do that politically? We talk about a second revolution. We really need a revolution in that area to re-examine where we're going with coal-fired generation for our, our electric uh, generation in the future. Coal has a, has a very stable price history, unlike natural gas, which is more volatile and, and always will be because of the nature of its, of its economics. But where does coal fit? Are, are we really moving coal to the side, as you would suggest? Well, in, in North Dakota, we are not. And here you, you've heard me talk about oil and natural gas, oil and natural gas, but in North Dakota we are not. We are very proud of our coal industry and, and we work very hard to make sure that government stays out of the way and, and, and utilizes that. One of the things that's very important with our coal industry and to understand is um, our transmission lines head towards Minnesota and I don't know if there's any Minnesotans here, but um, North Dakota is um, entering into a lawsuit with Minnesota because of the mandates they're trying to put on our transmission lines going out. With that, we've tried to appease them with one of our uh, electrical companies and added wind. Well, if you uh, think about wind and how it peaks up and down and you attach that to coal, it makes coal inefficient on the line. So we really don't want those types of mandates. We don't want those types of things. And coal is important. We have a great resource of coal in our state and, and we do it clean and we do it clear. We actually were able to get away from one of the federal mandates because we already had in place all of the clean things for that. The other thing with North Dakota is we do a lot of research in our um, Lignite Council and with that we have been working on the coal liquefaction and, and a lot of advancements with coal and, and we're, not, we're not pushing that aside. Coal is going to be around for a long time consider that about 40% of the nation's electric power generation comes from coal. So you just can't write that off. That would be like Germany saying they're going to shut down all their nuclear plants. Uh, I don't know how they're going to replace that electricity. Similarly, if we shut down all our coal plants, it would be very difficult to substitute uh, new power sources. So uh, coal is going to be around, but there are only one or two coal plants currently on the drawing board nationwide. As you know, a lot of coal plants have converted to natural gas. Uh, you're right. Historically, natural gas has, uh, prices have been volatile, but the consensus is that natural gas prices are going to remain fairly low for an extended period. Uh, so on a BTU basis, you know, right now, you know, gas is competitive with, with coal and, and nuclear. Having said that, I believe we need to have a balance in, in our energy mix, particularly in power generation, and coal has to be part of that. However, if some of these new EPA regulations that have been proposed uh, are enforced in the next couple of years, we could lose you know, up to 20, 25 percent of, of, of our coal-fired generation. Uh, over, over the next decade because the cost of compliance would be so high. And coal has been our, our least expensive source of energy. Right. Um, so when EPA takes coal off the books, even with natural gas prices declining, that will have a significant economic impact. Andrea Lee, Arkansas, Betty's best friend. Um, 
you've all danced around a little bit um, hitting how environmentalists are negatively affecting the energy of the future and I'd like you to hit a little harder on that if you would and the second part of the question is RPS is I'm guessing that all of you would support um, repealing all the RPS is in the states that have them well as my best friend has pointed out um, we her and I have battled um, that and worked very hard um, with with James in the ALEC organization with repealing and getting rid of some of these mandates and and really putting together um, what we hope is a proposal that all the state legislators are going to take back to start getting along in, in, in that track. So that being said, I'll go to the other portion and that with the environmentalists. Um, I interestingly, as the birds were brought up, um, North Dakota ended up in a, having a, 20 some of their oil producers in a lawsuit with the Department of Justice over 28 birds that died in holding ponds this spring when we were having our spring thaw and there were some issues with some of the water, the birds landed in the water, the birds died. I'm not talking endangered species here, I'm talking the mallards that were out shooting or the songbirds or whatever that fly across the road and you hit with your car anyway. And, and so there was this multi-millions of dollars wasted in lawsuits that eventually were thrown out. And, and so we have environmentalists all the way from the Department of Justice in our federal government that do cause a lot of problems and cause a lot of dollars wasted in our states. Uh, the EPA, the EP regulations that, that are brought up are, are, are downright scary. Um, they could shut down North Dakota at, at the stroke of a pen. And there are a number of those regulations that are just laying in, in the budget department just waiting for the day they get to come to the floor. And once they are there, they, they're signed, they're done, and this nation will feel those effects ripple very, very quickly. And, and, and also regarding environmental issues, uh, although public polls show that the American people by 75-80% margins believe our air quality is getting worse, we've seen a 67% decline in emissions since 1980, and that's accelerated in recent years uh, with, the, uh, with the increase of natural gases share in the electricity market. What we're seeing in terms of, uh, Betty talked about the war of words, is that uh, the environmental activists have convinced the American public that we need government to step in because we're, we're just getting so much worse in our environment. But the thing is, it's not necessarily economy versus the environment, heavy government regulations versus industry running amok. Allowing the market to run its course means that we're seeing natural gas, which reduces uh, the six principal pollutants tracked by EPA and carbon dioxide emissions. We're seeing through market forces a reduction in emissions. We're also seeing, for example, in Utah, uh, there's a company called Redleaf that would like to produce uh, uh, oil shale. They like to produce from oil shale. And they have these fantastic uh, uh, technologies and procedures to produce this in an environmentally friendly way, but the environmental activist groups have a knee-jerk reaction against it because it's a, quote, fossil fuel. And we don't have to have this false distinction between the economy and the environment, between heavy government regulation and industries running amok, because the environment, uh, environmental stewardship does very well under, under market forces, especially right now. and I'm visiting from Canada actually today. And I just wanted to say as your biggest exporter, importer of uh, gas that, uh, and, and of oil at least, that we, would, we were very disappointed when you didn't pass the XL uh, pipeline. And in fact, your environmental foundations are now coming to Canada to try and shut down the oil, signs in, uh, oil sands in its entirety. So it's a continental problem and it should be a continental solution. No, I, I, I agree with you fully. I, I visited the oil sands last summer, and here we have just another example of how the environmentalists have distorted, their, or they've painted a distorted picture of what's involved in extracting uh, oil uh, from the sands of Alberta. Uh, Alberta has very, very strict reclamation policies. Uh, what's more, uh, most of the oil does not come from open pit mining. It's coming from it, in situ drilling, which is very similar to uh, the way we drill uh, in shale formations from oil and gas. Uh, but the environmentalists have gotten the message out that the process of producing oil from the sands of Alberta is environmentally harmful. 
that it adds to global greenhouse gases, that it's dirty oil, that it's unsafe to transport this oil through a pipeline, although that oil has been coming to the U.S. for decades. Um, and, but that, that raises the broader issue. The, 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 the public overall is uninformed. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the environmentalists, though their message may be an incorrect one, have frankly done a better job of, of getting their message out uh, as compared to, say, the, yeah. the industry. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's yeah. the big The argument that forward. voters are stupid, I think, is not going to get us very far. I think it's wrong, and, and I think voter behavior really is not consistent with it. In terms of North American solutions, which I think is the phrase you use, mm -hmm. uh, I'd be very, very uh, suspicious because North American solutions sounds like governments colluding to me, and I would I would stay away from any such. Uh, I mean, take uh, simply take the Obama administration's decision for what it is. It's a a choice between the left-wing environmentalists on the one hand and blue-collar union workers on the other. And, you know, remember back in 08 when John Dingell was kicked out as chairman of the House Energy Committee in favor of Henry Waxman, uh, that was a clear signal that, that the left-wing environmental movement had uh, achieved a position of power within the Democratic Party greater than that of the union movement, the labor movement. And that is not going to change, and they're stuck with it. The irony, of course, is that if Dingell had remained chairman of that committee, we'd be much more likely to have a cap-and-trade bill now than we, than, and we don't, in part because Henry Waxman is so personally an unpleasant man, apart from all his other failings, that he simply cannot work with colleagues. I mean, you laugh, but that, that really is true. More generally, I, the ignorance issue, I, I really would not. Look, cap-and-trade restrictions on on, on carbon, whatever you believe about the science of, uh, of climatology, et cetera, uh, is basically an effort to transfer wealth from red states to blue states. And it's not very surprising that it gets political support in blue states that otherwise are uncompetitive because of high taxes and high regulations and welfare magnets and all the rest. And so I really, I, I think voter ignorance is really not a, uh, a useful way to approach these problems. And I urge all of you generally, and Bud in particular, to avoid that, avoid that framework. Uh, Bud has been wrong about a couple things today, and it's fun to beat up on him, and I think I'm going to do so. Um, there's the argument, I, I'm not going to repeat it, that it was a political faux pas, as, I, as you put it, for Mr. Obama to have uh, put the kibosh on the pipeline. No, it wasn't. It's a perfectly predictable outcome of political dynamics within the, uh, within the Democratic Party. And second, your argument that we sort of have achieved or witnessed the peak in energy consumption in the U.S., and we're never going to uh, we're never going to see that level of consumption again. Uh, I would bet my hind dollar that is not true. Well, that is growing what I economies said. use more energy. You can talk about all the technological advancements you want. Growing economies use more energy. Period. And you can't tell me that in 20 years we're not going to be using more energy than we did in 2005. And I'm glad we'll be using more, frankly, for all kinds of reasons. Actually, I didn't say that when I uh, said yes, you I did. was talking about peak oil, not peak energy. Well, fine. All right. And, and I mean, I don't, I don't want to rebut you. My, my concern, and what I hear from my Canadian friends, and particularly the Consul General in Texas, uh, they are very upset with Obama's decision. So it may have been smart for him to do politically in the domestic sense, but I, I just think internationally it, it, it really was a slap in the face. Well, and, and, and I'll tell you, North Dakota was not happy with the Keystone. We had 200,000 barrels we wanted to put in it right. now and another 200,000 later when they finished off the, the second side. So, um, no, we're not, we're not happy with that. We had to move to rail. Rail's more expensive. It's not what we want, especially coming now into the harvest season, to have all the rail tied up um, with oil. But, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a sad state state of affairs. I certainly do not want to see that oil going across to the East Coast and over to China. Um, so we certainly want to uh, have that changed. Next question. Uh, Representative David Meeks from Arkansas. Part of my district actually gets into the Fayetteville shale play. And one of the big things that we're dealing with now is, you know, th that these big trucks are tearing up our roads basically. Um, there's been two attempts, one by the Democrats last session, 
Uh, one now, they, they try to put an initiative, thankfully, they weren't able to gather enough signatures, it failed, to actually raise the severance tax because they say that, you know, natural gas is not producing enough. We're spending more on roads, which to me is a falsehood, uh, but that's a, kind of a different story. But how are you dealing with, I don't know if North Dakota has a severance tax, what it is. I mean, are you battling that with, okay, we've got this cash cow here, let's raise the severance tax, try to get a little bit more. Um, how are you paying for your roads potentially because you do have the big trucks going over them? So I, I didn't know if you could, maybe other people on the panel would have suggestions on how to deal with that. We, we do have a severance tax. Um, actually, last session, we only meet every other year. And while we were there, was actually the only legislation that was brought in was to lower it, not raise it. Um, we, don't, we don't deal with trying to raise taxes when you have a surplus. And so um, that, that was not the issue. But with the money that's coming out, we have um, redistributed, as awful as that is, um, as we've collected, putting it back into our oil producing counties. We have 17 major counties that are dealing with it, five that are truly impacted uh, heavier than others, and we're putting the infrastructure dollars back in. The biggest problem we have with the roads, and so if you are in that beginning phase, I would highly recommend get ahead of the play because what happens is um, we, our roads were so beat up that construction-wise, we can't even get ahead of that game again. And uh, we did, we, we had, one thing we had done was we had taken our Highway 2, of which isn't gonna mean a lot to anybody, but went from two to four lane, did it just before this play hit. So we've had a lot of beating up on that road, but it's taken a lot of traffic off some of the auxiliary roads. We will never catch up on our county roads. Um, it's just, it's, it, we can't put enough people out there to build the roads quick enough and to redo them and rework them. Uh, the township roads and stuff, um, we're just having to put down a lot of scorio. I don't know if that means a lot to you, but it's a hard, porous rock that'll grind in hard. And we're working on a couple of different um, developments. Actually, um, some people have come in with new product that can be put down on the dirt roads that actually produces it to the um, depth and density of concrete. And so we're utilizing that on some test projects. And that might be something you may want to check with us on in the future to make sure that we can get into that type of road process. And that was a fantastic point that Betty made uh, about uh, taxes, uh, how they're running a, a surplus. Wealth creation means that uh, you don't need to have higher tax rates. Uh, this is something that's often missed in the discussion regarding energy policy. If we do produce, or better, more accurately, if we do allow entrepreneurs, if we do allow free market enterprises to produce, well, then that allows the overall rates to decline. You can have surpluses without raising tax rates. Um, that's going to conclude our panel. We have lunch coming up. So thank you so much for being here. And how about a round of applause for our panelists?